When you join a choir, there are some elements of music theory that must be understood. There is a logic behind much of music, but some elements just need to be memorized. However, I'm going to try to give you as much of the story as possible to help everything stick in your mind so that you can remember it better. The first thing to note about music is that it's composed of notes, and the easiest way to see that relationship is by the piano keyboard. If you look at your screen here, you will see I have a piano keyboard here that I play. And as I play that, if you look right above, there is actually a second keyboard where you can see the notes that I'm depressing more clearly. Down in the bottom left hand corner, you will see what we call the grand staff. And the grand staff is simply how we notate the difference between various notes in music. If you notice on the grand staff as I play notes, that those notes are indicated by different notes on the grand staff. The grand staff has two parts. The top part is what we call the treble clef and the bottom part is what we call the bass clef. The treble clef contains the notes that we would usually play in the right hand and the bass clef contains the notes that we would play with the left hand on the piano. There are a number of different clefs, but for our purposes we're going to keep it simple and show you just those two clefs right there. Also, um, you need to know the letter names of the notes, and this is one of those things that's just a convention. Um, this note here, if you look at the three black keys, this note here between the top two black keys is the note called A. And the notes on the piano just simply go through the notes on the alphabet until you get to G. So we have A, B, C, D, E, F, and G. Uh, it starts again here, you see we have the same set of three, and that is also going to be an A. So you'll notice that throughout the keyboard we have a number of A's, and if you look on the computer screen you can see a number of the C's have been identified. This is a C that has a special, special name called middle C, and you see it's indicated as C4. The C below that is C3 and so on, up or down. We have the various, num um, various letters given. The grand staff actually has a number of spaces that you can memorize the letter names for those spaces. Uh, if you see the first space is called F, the next space is called A, and the next space is C, and the next space is E. Now, um, the notes in between those, of course, just follow along with the notes of the alphabet, but if you notice that, it very easily spells out the word face, F-A-C-E. Now, in the uh, bass clef, we also have spaces, and we have A, C, E, and G. The other notes you can figure out between them. How do you memorize A, C, E, and G? I like the acronym, All Cats Eat Gophers. So, there you go. Another note you want to memorize is simply what's called middle C. If you look on the staff, the, the, grand, the grand staff there, you can see this is the note middle C. Very often times you'll come back to that note, so you want to just have that one memorized as well. When you take notes and you put them together, we get what are called scales. And the notes that we use to form scales are called the diatonic order. Now, this word is an old word, and it takes some explaining. The diatonic order comes from the fact that this notes that we use on our keyboard are actually collected from the notes that are created by the overtone series. The overtone series is a very natural and very interesting phenomenon, and it arises from the fact that when you pluck a string, the string does not only vibrate as a whole string, but it will actually divide into two parts, three parts, four parts, five parts, six parts, and if you look at um, films of vibrating strings, even though we can't see with our own eye, you can actually see the string breaking into these various parts. Well, why are these parts important? Well, as the string breaks into parts, it actually creates different notes. And so as, if I were to take the note C and I were to divide it in two, it would double its frequency and give you an octave up it would give you what we call the octave. If I divide it into three parts, four parts, five parts, it will actually give you a whole series of notes. And the notes that we have on our keyboard actually are a collection of those notes and what we call the diatonic order. 
Now, the piano keyboard is very nicely arranged to show you that diatonic order. And the most common instance we have of the diatonic order is the Ionian mode. And now here you're going to get some words from um, ancient Greek history. And there's actually a number of different modes and they have names that come from areas in ancient Greek. We have the Aeolian mode, the Locrian mode, the Ionian, the Dorian, the Phrygian, the Lydian, and a version of that, the Mixolydian. Now, each of those names are from various portions of ancient Greece. Now, what is the difference between the various modes? Well, each of the modes is simply a order of what's called whole and half steps. Now, what is the difference between a whole and a half step? Well, a whole step is simply when you skip some other note before proceeding to the next one. So if I were to start on this tone and go a whole step, I would skip this note and go directly to that note. Okay, that would be called a whole step. If I were to start here and go up simply to the next note that I come to, that would be a, a half step. Okay, so there's a half step. Now, to show you the Ionian mode, which is the most common, we call it the major scale. I would start on the key of C and I would go on to the next note and that would be a whole step. Proceeding to the next, you'll find another whole step. Proceeding to the next, you'll find a half step. Next, you find another whole step, another whole step, a whole step, and finally a half step. Now, if you listen to that sequence, it will sound very familiar to you. We have many songs that use that sequence. You'll recognize this one. There's many, many different sequences that you can use, but that is what we call the Ionian mode or the major scale. Now, I'm not gonna show you all the modes. Um, you can see here the different modes and the different patterns that they have, but just in contrast, let me show you the other very familiar mode, which, or um, what we call the minor scale. It's the Aeolian mode, and this mode has a different pattern to it. If you notice in contrast here, if I start here, if I go from A to A, this will create what we call the Aeolian mode, what we call the minor scale. And you'll hear it has a different sound to it. It begins and then goes a whole step, half step, whole step, whole step, half step, whole step, whole step. Now you notice the difference in order there and also the difference in sound. This is the Ionian. This is the Aeolian. How do you create that difference in sound that you hear? It's simply the order of whole and half steps. What difference does it make? Well, first, let me play Joy to the World for you in what we call the major scale or the Ionian. Now I'll shift that down to the Aeolian and you'll hear the difference. You hear that now has a completely different sound. First to go over this, the different modes quickly here, the Aeolian mode goes from A to A. A good example of a song that uses this is God Rest You Merry Gentlemen. The next is the Locrian mode, which goes from B to B. This mode is not used very much, and that's pr primarily because it's first to its fifth note has a very dissonant sound to it. And so it's very difficult to write songs in this mode. The next is the most common to us, the major or Ionian mode. Sounds very familiar. The next is the Dorian. This goes from D to D. Um, a song that uses the Dorian mode is What Wondrous Love Is This or Scarborough Fair. The next is the Phrygian. It goes from E to E. And that, a good example is that, is the hymn, O Sacred Head Now Wounded. Um, the next is the Lydian mode, and this goes from F to F. That, the only one I could find from uh, the using the Lydian mode was the um, flying theme from the movie E.T. And the last one is the um, um, Mixolydian. It goes from G to G, and... 
The best example of the Mixolydian is actually a song called Old Joe Clark, which is a old bluegrass tune. So those are the various modes and a helpful observation to make is that all of these patterns are simply different sections of the same repetition. This is why the entire set of patterns is called the diatonic order. If you shift each of them over, you will see that you can actually have them all line up in the same pattern. So once again, if you observe how all of these various patterns of whole and half steps are simply sections of the same repetitious overall order, you can see what is meant by the term diatonic order. Now, as I mentioned before, each of these modes were used in ancient Greece and um, came, they all came from er different portions of Greece. Um, however, today, the modes that we use are simply the Ionian and the Aeolian, what we call our major and minor scales. The rest of them have been pretty much consigned to the dustbin of history. The modes that I've pointed out here were actually used quite extensively up through the time of the Middle Ages, and the tones that were used in the modes were actually attempting to hold to the perfect mathematical ratios that I just mentioned earlier in the overtone series. The ancient Greeks understood that the various tones that were in the scales were actually related to one another mathematically, and they saw it as part of the perfection of the universe that the tones that we found to be delightful to listen to were the tones that were actually related to one another in simple mathematical ratios. Well, as much as one may like to hold those perfect musical tones and their mathematical ratios, there was a difficulty. If you look at the keyboard, all of the tones that we have on the keyboard are related to one another by various frequencies. And if you put the tones together on the keyboard so that they relate to one another in the perfect mathematical ratios, the relationships to one another do not end up being even. If you will notice here, if I go from C to C, we have 12 tones. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Now, if you try to preserve those perfect mathematical relationships between the tones, all those steps end up taking and having various differing measures, okay? Some will be a larger gap than others. Well, <clears throat> this is not convenient musically because if you move around on the scale, the relationship between the tones is not going to be the same. This creates many inconvenient musical problems. And there was a fellow by the name of Johann Sebastian Bach who, though he was otherwise a very pious and God-fearing fellow, decided to do away with the perfect mathematical ratios that God had established in the natural musical order, and to even out all of these tones so they're actually all the same interval between one another. Now, why was this so attractive, and why did Bach do this? Well, because Bach wanted to take those patterns that we have from the musical modes and shift them to different places on the scale. So let's take the Ionian scale that I showed you before going from C to C. It would go once again with its pattern, goes whole step, whole step, half step, whole step, whole step, whole step, half step. What if I shifted that pattern and used the same pattern but started on a different note? For example, A. If I start here and I go whole step, whole step, half step, whole step, whole step, whole step, half step. Do you see I've created a scale that sounds just like this scale, but a little lower. Now, by evening out the spaces between all of these notes, it didn't matter where you started. So you could start here, or here here. 
all on those different scales. It doesn't matter where you start. If you keep the same pattern, you will create a scale with the same sound. Now, the master of this method, and one, as I mentioned before, was Johann Sebastian Bach. And he wrote a whole series called The Well-Tempered Clavier, where he chose different keys and shifted all over the keyboard, showing how using this well-tempered system, you could establish a great deal of flexibility in your music. Well, what this did was created a situation where we oftentimes had shifting key signatures. For example, let me go back here again. Now, if I start on the note C, I could get the Ionian mode just by playing the white notes. Now, notice if I start on A, what happens? I have to use some of the black keys. You notice there, instead of using the white key, I'm now shifting that up and using what's called a sharp. Okay, a sharp is where you start on one note, you shift it up and half step, and now you have the note just above it. So we start out, we introduce a sharp here, we keep playing, and we have to introduce another sharp here, a sharp here, or a flat coming down from above as it's doing here, and then our final note. All right, now <clears throat> when I'm playing that pattern, I have to introduce sharps or flats to correct from the natural white keys and make the same pattern starting on my new starting point. Well, in order to keep this from being very complicated, we create what's called a key signature. And if I go now to the key of A, it adds the sharps in that I need to create that scale. So when I play it, I don't have to add those extra sharps in. So if I play the scale now, notice that I didn't have to write in any extra sharps or flats because all the sharps that are in the key of A are given right on the scale. Another example would be the key of D. If I start here, I go whole step, whole step, half step, whole step, whole step, whole step, half step. Okay? And if I write this now in the key of D, it will add the sharps in that I need to create that new pattern. So I start here, I can play this scale without needing to write in those sharps that are given. Now, so what you have here is a new system called key signatures that allow you to shift these patterns around and play them anywhere on the keyboard. Now, in ancient times, I mentioned before, they used many different modes. And now we tend to only use the two modes and we shift them around a lot. And this really in large part is the um, legacy of Bach and his period musically. So we take those patterns and we start shifting them around on the keyboard and playing them in different places. Now there's an important little principle that can be explained quickly here by looking at the keyboard and that's called the circle of fifths. If I start on C and I play the major scale there, if I were to take that and now add one sharp to it, and I would go up to the note that is a, what's called a fifth away, that's simply because I play one, two, three, four, five notes away. If I start a fifth away, that will have one sharp in its pattern. See, it has one sharp. Now, if I move another fifth, I'll have two sharps. So I start on C, I move one fifth up, and I have one sharp for the key of G. If I move another fifth up, I'll have the key of D that has two sharps, okay? So if I start in the key of C, I have no sharps. If I go to the key of G, you'll notice now I have one sharp. And I go up to the key of D, and now I have two sharps. Now, the same thing works in the other direction using, instead of sharps, flats, okay? A flat is simply the note that you play that's just one half step below, okay? So if I take a note and I flat it, that is what we call a flat. So if I'm on B and I play B flat, that's simply indicated by that flat signal. Now, 
<clears throat> if I start on C and I go a fifth down, in order to create the pattern, the major pattern, I have to start here and I have to flat that note at the B. So in the key of F, we have one flat. You notice if I change to the key of F, it has one flat, and now I can play it without having to indicate that flat on the note. Okay, now if I add, if I go from F, I go down another fifth, I go down one, two, three, four, five, I come to the B flat. And here, if I want to create a B flat scale, I have to have two flats. Notice how I played the E flat. Now, in order to get that key signature, I simply go to the key of B flat. And now I have two flats, and I can play that scale without having to notate any sharps or flats. This is what we call the circle of fifths. And the reason why this is important is it's very easy in music to shift between one key and another if they are immediately adjacent to one another on the circle of fifths. So if I am in the key of C, it's very easy to slip into the key of G because it's just one flat that's added. And you'll notice oftentimes in our songs, we will shift from the key of C to the key of G or the key of C down to the key of F by adding a flat. So the circle of fifths is something you'll notice oftentimes happening in music. Now, I've talked a lot about tones, and the next thing I want to talk about is what we call intervals, and these are the relationships of various tones. If I start on the note C, and I go up one note, and I play that together, you'll see down the bottom right-hand quarter, that's called a major second, okay? Now, this interval is what we call a second. We start with the first note, and then we go to the second, we play them together, now that interval is called a second. If I play the first note, the second, and then the third, that's called a third. Okay, if I go up to the fourth, one, two, three, four, that's called a fourth, and so on. We go on up and we have a fifth. Go on up and we have a sixth. Go on up and we have a seventh. Okay, and then finally, we go all the way up to the top of the scale, and we have what's called an octave. Okay? All of those are what we call intervals, and there are variations on them. If you notice, this was called not just a third, but it's called a major third. And the reason why that's a major third is because that's a third that occurs in the major scale, whereas in the minor scale, we drop this down to give it our minor sound. This is a minor third. Same thing with the second. You have the major second, and then you have a minor second. There are other names that are given to some of the tones. If you notice here, this is called a perfect fifth. If I drop that, it's called a tritone. Why is it called a tritone? Well, you notice there's three whole steps. We go one, two, three. You have what's called a tritone. And also with these, the sixth has a major sixth and then a minor sixth. The seventh has a major seventh and then a minor seventh, okay? So those are all intervals that will occur. Now, the intervals are part of what allows us to form chords of various types. Now, when we sing, you'll notice often we will be singing chords. What is a chord? Well, simply the major chord is you start out with the scale, start off this, let's take for example, the C major scale. And now if I take the first, the third, and the fifth note in that scale, I put them together. This is what we call a C major chord. Now, if I were to add the seventh to that, okay, I take the chord and I add the seventh, now that's what we call a C major seventh scale. And there are myriad variations that you can do for creating chords. You have the major chord, and then if you drop the third down to a minor third, you have a C minor chord, okay? And these sort of variations go on and on. 
Before I continue any further, I would stop to, I'd like to stop just to give a big thank you to Mr. Nick Nunez of Improv Piano Tips for helping me create this video. Nick is a former great book student of mine and his videos on YouTube have been very helpful for my son learning some of their popular songs that they like to play. So anyway, very helpful website. I think you'll find it a big help to yourself. Improv Piano Tips on YouTube. Now, I have been discussing a great deal about the tones that are used in music. However, this is just part of music. Music also occurs in time, and by occurring in time, it needs to divide time up into portions. The way this is done in music is with a time signature. If you notice here in this music, we have a four and a four. We call this four, four time. That means that each measure, a measure is these little boxes that you see here, each measure has four beats and the note that is going to get the beat is the quarter note. Well, what's the quarter note? That's this note right here. These are all different types of notes. They have different names. This is a whole note, a half note, quarter, eighth note, sixteenth, 32nd, and so on. What this means is that if I placed quarter notes in this measure, there would be four that would fill that measure, okay? And if I played this now, you could hear those four notes would simply play on the beat, and there would be four beats to that measure. Now, if I took this note, which is called a whole note, and I added that to the measure, this note would go the duration of the whole measure. Rather than just having one, uh, four notes, it would just take one note that would go through the entire measure. So if I took four of these and placed them here, now if I play them, you'll notice these will go on the beat, there'll be four of them, and then this note will carry through the entire measure. Right. Now, that doesn't sound very interesting, and if you want to create more variety to your music, you begin to alter not only the notes that you use, but their time and their relationship to one another in harmony. If you remember, I talked about using various types of notes and um, their intervals. Well, what I'm going to do is now introduce notes that will be using eighth notes and I will put them at um, a third above these notes here. So I will take eighth notes and place them here and And then we will go and continue the pattern a little bit so we can hear the effect. All right, now you'll hear as these various notes come on, they will start to have a relationship to one another through time. Now, so each of these notes has a various time value that it takes up. And as you sing, you want to make sure that you know how those time values relate to one another. Now, you can start collecting notes and putting them together in more and more complex fashions. So if we were to take and alternate these tones, for instance, we could take these tones and remove them. and add in um, tones that were coming down, I could use perhaps the quarter notes and have them come down. And then I could alter that using eighth notes again. 
these eighth notes. And then going back to quarter notes. Okay, so now we have a sequence of tones here on the top that will give us some musical interest because it's providing a different variation in the rhythm that's used. And one of the tricks that you need to learn to master is how to count these tones. If you have quarter notes, it's very easy to count them. They're simply going one, two, three, four in each measure. So those will be easy to count. But these here, these eighth notes, you need to count one and two and three, four. So it'd be one and two and three, four. And then these, you'd count one and two, three, and I should have added one more note in there. Sorry about that. To finish it off, let's bring it back to our C. All right, so here, when you look at notes, you'll see that not only do they have a pitch, that is, they're going to be higher or lower, but they also come in rhythm. And so understanding how these notes relate in rhythm, you need to understand how they're related to one another in time. And so, once again, here, quarter notes, you have one of these per beat, okay? Um, this is the whole note. It will get actually four beats. It takes up the whole measure. These are eighth notes. There's actually two of them per beat. So you have to count them one and two and. You could also get sixteenth notes, which are very quick, but we don't see those very often, so I won't get into that. Now there's another trick you have to understand that's going to be used, and that is dotted notes. If I take a quarter note and I place that note, but then I add a dot to it, that means that the quarter note will actually get another half the amount of time as its own value. So the quarter note starts by getting one beat, but if you have a dot on it, then it's going to get another half of a beat. So this note here, a quarter note with a dot, gets one and a half beats. Well, that would mean the remainder left over to complete that second beat would simply be an eighth note. Now, these two notes together would create two beats. But what the effect is, instead of just simply coming on the beat, going like these, bum, 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 this is going to be bum, bum, bum. All right, if I repeated that same sequence, you can hear the effect that that gives nicely. Okay, so now you can hear this sequence. It's kind of dun to tun to tun okay? And so it delays that beat just a little bit. You can see this note actually comes in just a little bit after the second beat here. Okay? So you can listen to that. So this gives you a basic idea of how the rhythm is going to be read in the music. There are other things that you need to watch out for. If you, need, if you would like to have one note that's held over a number of measures or you want to combine notes, you can use what's called a tie. And it's just a line that will go here. If I were to draw a line between these two, that would mean that those two notes are actually tied together. So instead of this being held for four beats, it would actually be going on for a complete eight beats. The next thing that we're going to look at is what are called the musical parts. Singers are usually divided into four groups, and sometimes even more groups than that, but basically four groups, what we call basses, tenors, altos, and sopranos. And each of those has a vocal range that they can sing. Basses are the lowest, sopranos are the highest. Now, one of the things you will need to do is understand, with the help of your music choir director, which section you are to be in. Men are usually in the bass and tenors. Women are usually sopranos and altos. Sometimes um, younger boys will sing soprano and alto, and sometimes some altos will slip down into the tenors. So there's a little crossover sometimes. But what you want to find is the section where your voice feels most comfortable. Now. 
Um, these ranges that are shown are um, all of them uh, fairly aggressive. That is a very good bass can sing this range, a good tenor and good alto, good soprano can sing these ranges. Um, I'll try to sing them for you, more for grins and giggles than for anything. You can hear my voice try to stretch to come to these uh, ranges, but um, I am basically in the tenor range. And um, you start out with the bass range here. The basses would start just above middle C and sing from middle C down to the um, E just above um, a C2. So I'll try to sing that for you, starting here at the D above middle C. La 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 You can hear my voice struggling there, all right? So uh, on the tenor range would go from C down to the A ab um, below C3. I'll try to sing this going upwards. La 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 And that's a bit of a struggle for me on the top side there. Now altos would go from this E below middle C all the way up to the G above um, C5. And I'll try to sing it. You can laugh at me here. Okay, well, that's interesting. And uh, sopranos would start from this A and be expected to go all the way up to that C. Sopranos would be expected to be able to go from the A all the way up to that very high C. Well, it's going to be interesting. We'll see what happens here. Well, it's not even going to happen. So, anyway, that gives you an idea. You need to find the range that your voice will sing best in. All right? You will be able to contribute to your choir most effectively as you span whatever range your voice can be used uh, most beautifully. Now, so those are the various parts. We'll usually divide a choir up into those parts so people will sing next to people who are singing their same line. Now, um, when you look at music in choir, you will notice it's divided up into those parts. For example, here, if you notice this piece of music I was just showing you, we had a soprano line, an alto line, a tenor line, and a bass line. All of those lines are set apart for the various voices. And so if you're a soprano, you'll be singing this top line. Alto will be singing this line here. Tenor, uh, this line there, and the bass is on the bottom. Now, um, if you notice, the soprano, alto, and tenor are all using the same clef, what we call the treble clef. And you should note, just to help not have confusion here, the tenor uh, treble clef actually has a little eight underneath it which means that the notes that the tenors are singing are actually an octave lower than written. All right? So it looks like the tenors and the altos might actually be singing the same notes. And it's not the case. They're actually singing an octave lower. So now, oftentimes in traditional music, you will not have lines broken out like this, particularly in hymns. They oftentimes are all written on the same music. Now, this here is, once again, it's soprano, alto, tenor, and bass notes, but they're all put together on one um, grand staff. The soprano note, you'll notice, has its stem pointing up. The alto has its note pointing down. The tenor has its note pointing up. And the bass has its um, note pointed downward. So um, that's how you would look at notes, uh, music that's written in this form, and be able to pick out what your line would be. So the tenor line here, all these notes with their stems up, so just going from here to here to here to here. And then there, the tenor and bass actually are using the same, so that one note has an up and down stem, and here to here to here to here, and so on. Now, the next thing that we need to look at is doing some ear training. Um, this is what's called learning to sing a good pitch, and a very helpful little um, way of doing this is by going to an online tuner. Now at flutetunes.com you can find one of these and you simply go to flutetunes.com and go down to here tuner and you'll actually need to have a microphone hooked up to your computer. 
Now, if you look at this, you'll notice this, this is actually picking up the tones in my voice. And let me just put a one little pitch in for choir here and its um, practice in that it does le let you have an opportunity to control your voice in a disciplined way. Why is that important? Well, speech uses your voice. And um, when you sing, you're going to try to sing various tones and those tones, you will need to control your voice to sing. If you don't control your tones when you speak, this oftentimes is very uninteresting to listen to. For instance, if I speak like this, where I always use the same tone and same rhythm, starts to sound very irritating. Knowing how to vary your rhythm and vary your tone in speech makes things more interesting. All right, well, so how do you work on developing good pitch? What you're trying to do is learn how to sing notes on their correct pitch. Pianos are very good for their pitch. If they're in good tune, they will play a note very precisely. As you can watch, the piano is playing middle C, and this is registering, it's just a little bit high. I'm not quite sure why that is, but um, it holds the tone very nicely. I, on the other hand, have much more of a struggle. Now, I will try to take this tone and hold that pitch with my voice. As you can see, I'm getting it in the ballpark, but it's pretty unsteady. If I bring it down, if I, I should say I'm looking at G here, Oh, that's bad. It's F sharp. Let's try again. As you can see, I am sagging. This is not good. It takes a little thought. Now, this little tool is a good thing because it will actually force you to try to sing those tones and get them to stay put. Now, um, when you're in choir, you need to try hard to sing the correct tones and pitches. And as you sing, the more discipline you can bring to that, um, the better you will sound in choir and the better you'll help the choir to sound. Good exercises to do is simply sing various sequences of notes. La 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 Now the more training that you do on listening to tone, making sure that you can sing them accurately, the better you'll be prepared to enter into our exercises. Thank you for watching this video. I hope this helps you to be a better choir member and be able to participate in your choir in a stronger fashion. Being able to sing in a choir is what I think of as one of those fundamental human activities, whether it be learning to swim or learning to walk or learning to ride a bike. It's one of those things that pretty much everybody needs to learn how to do at one time or another. And the younger that you can pick it up, the younger you will be able to enjoy that process and be able to learn it and carry it with you. It's something that you can always enjoy and participate in throughout life.